From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They called me Ben. We're joined with our guest super producer, Max Freight Train Williams. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know live and direct uh, with an audience of uh, four. It's true. You guys maybe don't even know this. We don't talk about it that often. But for the last handful of years, I guess, since a certain weirdo event happened in the news, you might have noticed, uh, we've been recording in our separate domiciles. And today we're not for, I think, the first time in a long time. We got one or two in-person episodes done at hotel rooms. Uh, oh, that's, that's right. true. That's right. That's its own weird kind of situation, though, right? Mm-hmm. We are now today, though, coming to you from our state-of-the-art new facilities. Uh, yeah. The iHeart Radio podcast studios. Yeah, to paint the picture for you, conspiracy realist, uh, there is what I consider an egregious amount of sunshine coming through the windows. <laughs> uh, we're, so we've got some work to do, and it was just like preparing to launch a spaceship. Uh Max and Matt and Noel and I and our pal Tyler uh, were coming through and like fixing, double checking uh, different technical aspects. We figured it out. We're here for you. We have also, I would argue, over the years, we have been in so many crazy situations. uh, We have had kind of an education via experience, an education via fire. You know what I mean? Um, Like you said, Matt, recording in hotel rooms, you know, bunkers. Yeah, bunkers. Noel, you were uh, getting under the table and we were like trying to figure (laughs) out uh, power and ampage and And stuff. And dreaming. I was under that table Mm -hmm. and dreaming. did mention. Yeah. And this is like our education that we have received here is not institutionalized, right? I see what you're doing. Yeah, it's stuff where we have (laughs) we have had education by mistakes. Like it's it's weird to say it now, but at this point in the life of this show, uh when people are starting their own shows and they're asking us questions, we can actually answer a lot of them because if there's a wrong answer, we did it already. Yeah. Oh yeah. But there was a path in a weird way for us, right? That's right. Like, in in this studio, right outside the door, there's a huge picture of our podcast logo, and it's right next to uh, the face of Ron Burgundy. Yeah. And that's weird. It's very weird. That's not even his real name. Did you guys know (laughs) that? I I found out the other day. He's some kind of actor. But I guess what I'm saying is we've we've learned a ton as we've made all these mistakes, but there has been a pathway for us to get to where we are right now, and it was, I don't know if it was visible or... I, I don't know. What do you guys think? It's kind of ad hoc, honestly. The, 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 I used to maybe sell myself short and say like, oh, you just sort of stumbled your way into every opportunity that presented itself to you. But then I realized, like, as I've gotten older, is like, no, whether I knew it or not, I was subconsciously forging a path with the decisions that I made that kind of led me from one thing to the next, you know, whether it be uh, through mistakes, uh, screwing something up and moving on to something else or whatever. There was, a, a, you could mark a trajectory, but it's the kind of thing you don't see until you zoom out. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can always see the trees better in retrospect, right? And we all came to this through different ways. Uh, I, of course, made an infernal covenant that will have consequences down the road. Uh, we are fans of school. I think it's I think it's fair to say, like, are you guys fans of school? Do you look back on your school days fondly? No, I don't no. Mean, I, okay, I'm 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 a fan of learning. Okay, um, there was a period of school that I liked more than other periods, but overall, I would say was it was it uh, the free period? No, it was, <laughs> yeah, actually, it was <laughs> study hall. No, I mean I, there was a time I went to a fine arts magnet school, and so I was surrounded by like like minded kind of nerdy you know arty music kids, and then my family went through a, a transition. My father lost his job, and we ended up having to move to Birmingham, Alabama where I was plunged into the public school uh, system of Hoover, Alabama, which is like the movie Varsity Blues or one of those football reality shows. And I did not do I did not take well to it, let's just say. Mm. So what about you, Matt? Um, I loved school. 
Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, I I love it. I want. I, I keep going like back. <laughs> I love. I love things like Khan Academy. There are so many resources to learn online now. Noel, I think you make a very good distinction between learning versus school, right? An education system, a, a methodology, an institution. A lot. Most people love learning. It's very like we have different modes of learning, but it's extremely rare to go to a human being and say, do you like learning? And for them to go, nah, I'm good with what I know now. You know what I like? 74. That's the highest number. <laughs> uh, but but school can sometimes not this one size fits all approach to teaching uh, leave some people out in the cold and everybody no matter what you think personally or what your school experience is like everyone on the planet agrees education of some sort is vital for any society to continue that's why education is always an ideological battleground you know what we're taught how we're taught who is allowed to teach us these are the subjects of numerous conspiracies across decades centuries millennia probably and tonight we're diving deep into a strange claim about public schools what if they were created with an ulterior motive here are the facts yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting question, um, and, and it goes into things I think that we've all experienced, like the idea of uh, tech prep versus like vocational prep or whatever it might be. They call them tracts, right, which I think is an interesting term, uh, given what we just talked about, about our trajectories throughout life. Or magnet know? schools. Like I, I was um, – this is a true story. I don't talk about it often. I had a, um off-the-books deal – with uh, the uh, high school that I had attended for a time where they said, as long as I was making them look good in communicative arts, I didn't have to do any math. Nice. So I got like a nerd version of a football deal. That's awesome. I was also, I mean, I'm not saying you're necessarily terrible in math. Math was just not my strong suit. I was much more of a verbal guy. But um, it's interesting. The history of public education in the U.S. actually dates back to Boston. Uh, and the history of modern public education uh, in the world begins in Prussia, which is weird. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. Right? Prussia with a P. Um, we'll, we'll get to all that. And the very first public school uh, in the U.S. was the Boston Latin School. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if we could break down the Prussia thing a little bit because it it almost feels like it speaks to this episode a little bit in my mind. But maybe that's my preconceived notions, right? The, <laughs> the idea of making everybody's education the same, right? Right. Versus the town school or the neighborhood school or the church. Yeah. 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 The um, the if you live in the kind of world that we live in on stuff they don't want you to know. Well, then when you hear the name Prussia, your ears just perk up. You know, we're not instantly saying it's bad, but no. we are. It, it is strange. It's a fact a lot of folks don't know. Um, Prussia, we'll, we'll get to the Prussia model and why it's so important in, uh, in our exploration today. Uh, we should establish, I think, that the Boston Latin School was not Prussian at all. The Boston Latin School uh, was pay to play. It's older than the U.S. It was it dates back to 1635, and uh, a few years later, the first taxpayer-supported school, the Mather School, get it, like Cotton Mather, uh, 1639. Uh, this is also in Massachusetts, and this was a big deal because before before school was a commonplace thing. If you were growing up in the U.S. colonies, you would learn about life or socialization from your family, your church, other people in your community, and then uh, you would get an apprenticeship. And usually people would tell you what that apprenticeship was going to be. Mm. It, this was not the time of like, dream big. What, what do you want to do, young Esmeralda? I want to be a witch. Not really. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool. Yeah. There's no, there are no surprise trade crafts there. You you go in knowing, oh, I'm going to apprentice as this position, this job, this important thing well, that literally the town thing, needs. Yeah, yeah, good thing I like making barrels. Because well, they didn't have the luxury of being able to pursue the academic arts, you know, or study music. That was all very, like, kind of superfluous, you know, or or literally left to a very select group of folks that were probably, like, monks or something, you know? Either, yeah, either um, 
either members of the clergy or what we would consider the upper crust, the elites, would have the leisure time to pursue those things. I mean, it sounds really focused in the beginning, that 1635 Latin school. It's a (laughs) Latin school. Right. When people were literally speaking Latin, you're learning how to read Latin, write Latin. I mean, maybe it's more uh, widely focused than that, but it sounds like that's pretty much what that the nature of that school was and is is the mather school really named after cotton mather because like if it is then it's almost like going to a a, re- a religious school or something right i mean i don't know maybe yeah, i'm wrong it's it's um named after richard mather oh, okay that's uh but still kind of the same it's it's the oldest public education school richard mather was a um the grandfather of cotton mather okay wow uh, and he was a puritan minister so that's that's how old this place has been and i love that we're pointing out literacy so you'd get the basics of literacy and arithmetic from your parents assuming they a knew that themselves and Mm -hmm. b felt it was worth their time to teach you because otherwise they would just say you know get back in the field right yeah and don't come back until you've killed three rabbits and they're like well what is three and they're like ah i knew there would be consequences (laughs) (laughs) well Well, well, let's let, okay. So we're talking about two Boston schools, right? The earliest mm-hmm. forms of this. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about why the Eastern Seaboard of the United States, where those original colonies were. Why were they more more forward with this? I think it has to do with uh, the Reformation, right? Yeah. So New England, as we know, was a hotbed of a, or a kind of a seat of the Protestant Reformation. Um, so therefore, um, they kind of were a little bit of the head of the curve in terms of literacy, right? Yeah, they were kind of radicals mm-hmm. of their time. and Because they had to be able to spread word <laughs> yeah. of said Reformation with like treatises and whatnot. Yeah, the idea is that we don't need um, we don't need the Catholic hierarchy to intercede on our behalf. We can communicate and learn from the divine directly because we have the power to read scripture. So they, they're much more literate than the more southern colonies but they're also very much focused on scripture. You know mm. what I mean? They're not, they're not reading Harper's or whatever. Yeah. Well, and but they also didn't have a bunch of schools early on. They had uh, like private help, right? Often. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the South. So in the South, which was always um, a more brutal hierarchical arrangement, you would have a ton of, so 1600s, you have a ton of indentured servants first. They can't read and the people at the top are stoked about that they don't want people to be able to read what they do do (laughs) never not hilarious what they do do is they uh they take their kids the children the scion of the of the wealthy agricultural class and they get them private tutors like you were talking about that or if they're really flexing they send those kids back to england Wow. Oh, okay. And indentured servants, I mean, that's just like one click away from slaves. Mm-hmm. And slave owners obviously also did not want their slaves to be able to read because that was a way, a catalyst for uh, revolution or for revolt, There's right? There's power in there, man. Oh, 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you can keep people docile and you can restrict their ability to teach themselves, then you are, you know, you're the only game in town, right? Uh, and Anyway, there are so many things to say about this. We know over time schools did eventually become the norm in the United States. They have a lot of problems. It goes state by state. Not all schools are equally good um, and not all of them have the same problems. But overall, it's a good thing they exist. Right. Even even for uh, the anti-authoritarians in the crowd this evening, it's good that people want to teach people to read, right? Like we can ag- Yeah. That's not a hot take. No. No, it's not. And the the country at large, right, as the idea of a publicly supported educational system as it started to spread, people were on board, right? And they're like, "Yeah, we don't mind chipping in a little bit of our taxes so that everybody around these parts can read and know how things work. Ooh. Like the, oh, <laughs> there it is. Like, like the Hope Scholarship here in Georgia, you know, a uh, lot it's a, it's a vice tax. I'm playing the lottery or it was, and it would help send children to college. Uh, when the argument 
against things like the Department of Education, which is also imperfect, or the argument against taxpayer-supported schools, it kind of falls apart when you realize that every time a kid gets a successful education leading to employment opportunities, that's one less person who is going to be out stealing car radios. You know what I mean? There are long-term benefits. Well, also, who, who could potentially be a drain on the system in terms of welfare or whatever it True. might be. You know? yeah. That's its own other uh, discussion, and yeah. it's rife and very uh, rocky in and of itself, obviously. Well, let's talk about curriculum, because what, what are, as the first public schools are starting to originate, what are kids learning? Latin. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> Super useful. For exorcism. Common language. In cursive, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Those yeah, were yeah. the two. Latin and cursive, <laughs> um, and then counting to 74. No, you raise a good point. There was um, a much more blatant emphasis on what was considered um, moral intelligence, morality teaching. And if you were a teacher, then this is before the era of like the cool, edgy professor all Jeff Goldblum in mm-hmm, Jurassic Park style. Mm-hmm. You are a paragon of what puritanical society considers good. And they're pretty strict about so, that. So it might be what we would see today in Catholic schools or in mm-hmm. any kind of religious schools sure. where, you know, the curriculum includes just as much scripture and sort of um, philosophical conversation and, and learning th- as it does mathematics and, and science and, and history. Right. Study of the classics, the time of the classical education, right? This person, um, <laughs> this, this person may not know everything um, that we consider important in the world of arithmetic, but they can quote the Aeneid to you. Uh, they mm-hmm. can and they can tell you who begat whom mm-hmm. in the Bible. Oh, that book is whom? long. <laughs> whom? Uh, I, I got to tell you guys just a little tick I have. Sometimes when a phrase comes out of somebody's mouth, a song plays in my head and it happens way too often and I, I don't like it because I don't I often don't want to just spurt it oh, out. It What's the to song? Me all the time. Yeah, you you said the phrase Catholic school. Do you know which song like jumped into my head? Oh, uh, Catholic school as bitter is, as Roman rule. Really? That's it. Yeah, I don't know that song at all. What the uh, hell? Is I'm that just song? not really singing it. <laughs> no, but what is the song? Uh, uh, I will follow you into the dark. Yeah. That's it. Oh, okay, wow. sorry. No, it just so happens. You sometimes. know this. <laughs> I don't think I do. Okay, but, oh, is it like it's? Me. I'll follow you, you into, into the, the dark. dark. Okay, so it's an emo vibe. I, you know what it's I mean? Really I, I immediately picture "Hit Me, Baby, One More Time." Oh. Anytime someone says Catholic school, so uh, that's because I'm a filthy old man. <laughs> <laughs> I um I had to uh, do some programs at at some Catholic schools, and I'll tell you, you know, it's nowadays there. It's a really solid education because it emphasizes whipping. It because it emphasizes whipping. It's basically Fight Club. Mm-hmm. It's Fight Club, and there are weapons allowed. Uh, no, not to disparage the Catholic the Catholic school, but like it, there is that moral that moral aspect to it. Of course, the religious aspect, but they do emphasize uh, what you would call secular skill sets. Uh, so it is. It, it is a good idea. They're also private schools, typically, so right. <laughs> they're being funded by tuition rather than government and tax, you sure. know, or whatever. So. And with the cosign of one of the most powerful organizations in the world. Not even well, – okay, I'm not, not doing papist conspiracies, but like – the very powerful people. They're, Almost as powerful as the Mormon church with a hundred billion dollars. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. Check out check out our uh, strange news. Uh, so, all right. The cool thing is by the mid-1800s, and we are getting to conspiracies here, most states had three assumptions that everyone accepted. Schools are a good thing and they should be free. Uh, we're going to pay for them with taxes. Teachers should have some sort of education themselves which is, you know, baller, and that children should be required to attend school for some time. Now it's typically from about 6 to 16. Uh, You fast forward to today, um, like you said, no, there are plenty of alternative schooling paths available. You can be homeschooled, for example. You can go to private schools. But the U.S., at least on paper, wants to give everybody the opportunity to study whatever they wish if they are able to do so. So not everybody is going to have the chops to be a nuclear engineer, but if you are capable of that kind of uh, that kind of cognitive work and you want to do it, 
you should be able to do it no matter who your parents are. Sort of a bootstrap philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is important to note, while we are these United States, schooling in public education is often a state-based thing. So you're not going to get the same thing wherever you travel around here. Right. Well, not even to mention state by state, school district by school district. County by county. That's what I meant, county by county. I mean, people, you know, go way in over their heads when it comes to buying a house so that their kids can be in, quote, unquote, the good school mm -hmm. district. Zip code um, by zip code. It's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, I was very lucky. I, I, I was able to buy a house in a neighborhood that I could afford, but the school is bad. A bit, my kid also lives with her mom, who lives in the good school district. Oh, uh, snap. Um, oh, because yeah. she, she rents currently. So uh, we kind of made an agreement that I would buy this house and that she would continue renting until uh, our kid's done with school, which isn't much longer. FBI, this guy right here. Yep. Hey, listen. <laughs> no, I'm not doing anything illegal. No, she it's a loophole. Yeah. It's messed up, though, dude. I mean, yeah. it's, it's wild that a place geographically, you know, separated by um, miles could have a, such a vast difference in quality of education. Schools are ranked, you know what I mean? And like, well, we'll get into standardized it's, testing yeah. and stuff later. But anyway, it's it's a huge it's a huge challenge, you know, and uh, this what this inherently means is that entirely due to the lottery of location, uh, the country is losing potential doctors, potential professors, nuclear engineers because of these various um, interseen wars of ideology. And the, the story is full of ups and downs. You know, I just think it's full of ups and downs. But if you look at the history of public education in the U.S., what you see is a miniature version of the history of the country's conflicts writ large. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, not to mention things like political line drawing, gerrymandering, and all of that stuff uh, that is a product of things like the Civil War, you know, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, ideological and political conflicts of various stripes, um, you know, separation of church and state, all, all of these kinds of things. You know, we are seeing the aftermath of that, or at least there is an indelible mark left on our public education system because of these events. And most of those marks, those indelible ones, aren't like good like it's inherently kind of created a flawed system well there are are scars too from it you know a a scar is a powerful analogy because it shows that something bad happened but it also showed that you survived and the <laughs> that's waxing a little poetic i think but but we see you know, we, we see the heroic efforts of the civil rights movement, right, which gave uh, – was a strong step in the continuing struggle for equality. And we see other weird things like the Pledge of Allegiance comes in not at the beginning of public education. Yeah, the Pledge of Allegiance didn't have under God in it until 1954 uh, and – it wasn't. What was it before? It was. It just didn't have under God. It was just one nation. And pledge Indivisible? allegiance to the flag. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It was just there was a big flag worship kind of movement. <laughs> I make it sound like a pagan cult, but uh, but yeah, I uh, as our pal Max, super producer Max Freight Train Williams pointed out, uh, Eisenhower. Uh, the Eisenhower administration added under God to the Pledge of Allegiance during the Cold War, which I think means it's time for a crossover that I hope doesn't embarrass you too much, Matt. It's Max with the Facts. Are we actually going to do the thing? <laughs> oh, we have. We must. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. It's so, it, it makes, no, I don't know about you, but I think it makes both of our days, whatever we get to play it. I mean, <laughs> peek behind the curtain. We don't actually get to hear it in real time. No. Uh, but y'all are lucky out there. You get to um, hear this beautiful sound cue, courtesy of of uh, of, of, of Matt, uh, Matty Two Hands. Who's that coming into your phone? It's Max, Max! and he's got the knowledge. 
It's live. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so yeah, this, this stuff changes, right? You know, and you see the concerns over uh, religion in schools, right? Should prayer be allowed? Should, it, should a specific religion be forced on children who don't practice it? Uh, and overall, despite all these problems, the idea of public education is better than nothing. It's way better than being born into a family and having someone say, well, uh, we make doorknobs here. So I hope you like doorknobs because that, Josiah, is the rest of your life. Like it's it's better than that. You can you can be something different. You you have power. Unless that is there's a conspiracy afoot. What if the goal of public education isn't to make new doctors, empower engineers, teachers, astronauts, and so on, what if it was primarily built to ensure a steady stream of docile, hopeless factory drones? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Okay, there's this uh, quote I, have you guys seen this quote before from uh, it's often attributed to uh, legendary pill John D. Rockefeller? Old JDR, notorious pill. Yeah, you're talking about I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. Yeah. I seen it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I could also see it like inscribed in, in, in some sort of creepy statue of, of Rockefeller. You oh, know what 100%. I mean? Like in like the dystopian, you know, um, socialist version of our world. <laughs> you know, like you, well, I could see it too if you, uh, if you've ever been in kind of a, a very posh environment. You get those clues that you're hanging out with the one percenters. Uh, <laughs> I could, I could totally like you're in the skull and bones hangout or you go to a soiree and then they've got, they've got a big picture Mm -hmm. of Rockefeller. Right. And then maybe there's a bunch of like, he's standing on a bunch of poor people. Right. Or or at the very least, there's just like a throng of like faceless, you know, Mm -hmm. multitudes assembled. Uh, I mean, listen, this is all a product of capitalism and everyone can't be John D. Rockefeller. There can only be a handful, you know, it's like Highlander rules. And, and that guy's uh, monomaniacal. Oh, one he million mental percent. issues. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. But but the big question is, did he actually say it and why did he say it? And, and what did he mean? Right. And what, what consequences were there for that? sentiment frankly whether he said it or not the sentiment clearly holds true it feels like and we're gonna get into it right we're gonna we're gonna go through that but i want to pause it here guys what is better literally seriously on the level a nation of thinkers or a nation of doers i think that's a valid argument i had some i had some changes of heart while working on this too um they're also not mutually exclusive i I agree I agree. Just think about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Once you once you get too thinky, sometimes you don't want to do it. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? You're yeah, like, yeah. oh, but I'm thinking too much. Mm-hmm. I'm just am interested in this. I, I think it's more nuanced than this is bad. Kind right. Of it's thing. like the, oh, the quote, like, um, I knew a guy who could speak seven languages but couldn't figure out how to ride an ass. As in a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> As in a dog, you dirty, dirty boys. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but just, people don't call it that anymore. <laughs> but that's the quote. <laughs> oh, it's a quote. I, yeah. I, you said it as though you were just saying that. <laughs> like, off the, off the dog. Oh, no, that let a, me get the actual that was quote. A, <laughs> ride that ass. <laughs> just <laughs> tell me a big call. I love it. I love it. Oh, love my boy. No, but this is very, very important, and I think we'll, we'll get to this as well. It, it is nuanced because, you know, there are plenty of dewy thinkers, you know? Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, plenty of thinky doers. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, like, what do we need in a society that yeah. that thrives on capitalism and year over year growth yeah. that corporations depend on? We we really need there to be a separation and a hierarchy, and it behooves us and my us. I'm I'm hypothetically being part of the this, Rockefellers. this Rockefeller class to you know create this worker pool. You yeah, know, otherwise, weird. who's going to make our our stuff? It's well, weird. This is okay. These are excellent points. This is the root of the conspiracy. Back in 1903, and this is true, Rockefeller and his goons or his cohort, whatever you want to call them, (laughs) they created something called the General Education Board. What do we say about innocuous names? 
They're perfect. <laughs> They're nothing to see here. The call was perfect. It was a perfect call. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it was a perfect call. Uh, GEB is an organization that's dedicated to, uh, quote, improving education throughout the United States. And at first blush, this is actually pretty progressive for the time. They say, look, we're going to promote education within the USA without distinction of race, sex, or creed. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Yep. That, sound, that sounds like sci-fi future talk to the average person in 1903. Almost as though it's too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's weird because if it really is that, without distinction of race, sex, or creed— what happened during the civil rights movement where stuff was all messed up? <laughs> right, exactly. What happened uh, What happened during the Reconstruction period uh, post-Civil War? You know, yeah. the, the age of Jim Crow and so on. Uh, old Rocky put a lot, who was a notorious cheapskate, by the way, he put a lot of money into this and the statistics are nuts. In 1903, he kicked off the General Education Board with $1 million. In 1903, do we have the calculator for that? We do. And One gazillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, pretty close. He just he just uh, made it rain with a uh, 34.6 million dollars in today's money in 2023. Wow. That's nothing. That's tiny beans. But that's beans. tiny beans? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's tiny beans for That's tiny beans for old uh, Rocky Oh, oh, Rockefeller. I mean, uh, again, we're talking about the kind of wealth that you can only accumulate when you're like the first one that starts an entire industry, <laughs> you know, like legacy money. Like, like you can't even do that anymore. No, you, it's not even possible. And and uh, again, pardon my French here. He was f***ing crazy. He we were talking about this off air. He had a personal holiday that was more important than his birthday. It was job day. He called it. Mm -hmm. It's the first day. It was the day of his first job. Wow. He was like, he was like um, the main, uh, oh, the patriarch of secession. Was that Logan? Yeah. yeah. Roy. Sure. Yeah, Logan sure. Roy. Logan Roy. And uh, even then, being a cheapskate, very, very monomaniacal, uh, in just a few more years, by 1907, he had donated somewhere north of $43 million all to this organization. We, This is the mind-blowing thing. We do have inflation calculation for this. Oh, uh, let's, uh, here we go. $43 million in 1907 dollars is $1.396 billion dollars. Insane. That's crazy. To, to public education. Well, specifically. To generalized <laughs> education. <laughs> specifically to this one pet project. That's crazy. Imagine, you don't even really see that anymore, right? To the point about, like, this guy has wealth that can break the system. It's like at the, he is like the uh, person at the end of an RPG that doesn't, doesn't ever really stop. You know, like when you're done with Skyrim and you've got everything and you've just sort of broken the game and you walk around, he has broken the game. He's walking around. God mode. <laughs> He's on God mode. Yes, just so. And at the time, this $43 million was the largest gift to any philanthropic organization in the entire history of the U.S. Uh, you can go to the official Rockefeller site and they will uh, they will tout and trumpet. Uh, his activities there, but the GEB was pro education, and they were also they were also pretty. I spy a Jonathan Strickland walking by. Oh no, he can't go that way. It's blocked. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there he is. Uh, let's keep that part in. <laughs> no. Having the windows is interesting. So this. Uh, okay, so the GEB is pro education. But they also have very specific ideas about who should learn what. Yeah, yeah, because there's no distinction between race, sex, or creed, right? Uh, <laughs> so mm, there might be, uh, let's call it discrimination based on location. Ah, got you. They work in the South, right? And they work in the South. Um, they work all over the U.S., but extensively in the South until 1964. And they got a reputation for 
consistently pushing poor and minority students away from college and saying, okay, <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to be a philosopher? Your town already has a doctor. You know what I mean? What we need is somebody to take care of all of these peaches or mm. all this cotton. And, or I can see that uh, maintenance, like mm-hmm. vocational stuff yeah. is pushed really hard. Right. Wow. We need a car. We need a mechanic. You know? Yeah. Jeez. So that's what they would do even if kids were like, hey, I'm very good at math. Or, hey, I have such a knack for languages. I'm like, well, you know, uh, plumbing is kind of like a language. I bet you could build signs real good. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so – we got to go to a great paper by these two authors, Louise Fleming and Rita Saslaw. Uh, they have – they wrote a pretty extensive examination of the history of the GEB and – well, let's just give people a quote, I guess. The problem is not with opening doors to poor children as the philanthropists viewed their donations, but with closing doors to any other area a student might choose to pursue. It is with the belief that a student's lot was known and that there – the future lay. Wow. Wow. It's, it, mm. we've seen that in depictions of kind of post apocalyptic slash post um, utopian mm-hmm. stories, right? Mm-hmm. Where everybody's future is laid out for them the moment they're born or even before they're born. Oh, and sure. All of that kind of thing. Logan's it, run. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's weird to imagine that it was an, it was attempted. Even back then. Oh, from yeah. From 19, was it 1904 or 1903 to 1964? Mm. Wow. Which means there are people listening today who were alive when the GEB was still active. Yeah. Um, and the consequences of this thing carry on. The Okay, the, the, the quote itself, so sometimes people are worried about the wrong thing. The quote itself doesn't really show up until much later. There's a great Snopes article you can read that dives into this, the idea that I don't want a nation of thinkers, I want a nation of workers. It appears earliest in a documentary in 2006. What? Yeah, called One Nation Under Siege, which is sort of a mixtape of different conspiracy theories. You can't find John Rockefeller actually saying this. You can find people saying that he said it, which is not the same thing. Um, but we did find something a little bit more creepy. Regardless of what John said, he had a lot of advisors, and one of them said something not just similar, but way more detailed and way more disturbing. In a book called The Country School of Tomorrow, a Rockefeller advisor named Frederick Taylor Gates, who was a grand poobah in uh, the GEB, he, in this book uh, from 1916, says the following. He goes hard on the paint and the class system stuff here, the conspiratorial aspect, is readily apparent. It's a long quote, but I think we should do the whole thing. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or men of science. We have not to raise up from among them authors, editors, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for... Uh, this is an ellipsis within the quote, great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we may have an ample supply. The task we set before ourselves is very simple as well as a very beautiful one, uh, to train these people as we find them to a perfectly ideal life just where they are. So, We will organize our children into a little community and teach them to do in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. In the homes, in the shops, and on the farm. We're going to make better slaves. You guys, that's what he's saying. He's like, Johnny, I got a hot pitch for you. All I need is like $44 million dollars. And we're going to have the best proles ever, you know? And this is before the use of the word prole like that. Why is it that I picture a delightful pastry when you say proles? I'm thinking of profiteroles. Sorry, that's <laughs> right. different. That's different. Yeah, uh, uh, profiteroles, they're the proletariat of pastries, mm-hmm. yes. From uh, Pfizer. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I also started with a P, and the P is silent. So 
It does sound like it, though, right? It sounds like he's saying we want more perfect workers in the bottom of society, yes. in our class system, and there's not room at the top for everyone. Yeah. We, he literally says we don't need to make any of these things out of anybody that we're going to be working with. Because those politicians, doctors, engineers, and so on, their jobs are going to go to their kids. Of course, we're going to make them at Harvard. <laughs> right, exactly. Legacy students, what could go wrong? Uh, and if um, if there are any legacy students in the crowd today hearing this, um, Conan, no, no offense to you as a person, but as a piece of the system that is intensely problematic. Oy. Uh So anyway, but th- so this guy is one of the dudes who makes the GEB. Rockefeller may not have said a specific quote, but he certainly was 10 toes down with the idea of more perfect slaves. Yeah, it feels that way. A more perfect union for more perfect slaves. You know, maybe we should change the title. A slave of this. by any other name, you know, still, yeah. still a slave. Uh, I mean, again, all this goes into the idea of prison labor. You know what I mean? Or it doesn't go into it, but it's a similar. It does. Uh, yeah, it's a similar philosophical loophole, right? Mm-hmm. Like on right. paper, these aren't slaves or mm. indentured servants or the bad things from history's past, uh, but functionally, yeah, pretty much the same. Yeah, and the GB in specific. Focusing on what we can prove. It was created to propagate what they thought of as lower class workers. And as you know, on this show, folks, we are huge fans of the trades. More people in the U.S. should be pursuing the trades. College has often in recent decades been sold as a kind of bait and switch. And it put a lot of people in debt, right? And I think that was a feature for the villains in charge of it, not a bug. Uh, so there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm going to become an expert in this technical field. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm-mm. But Mm. the GEB folks were incredibly condescending about this, and they did think that folks who went to public school were beneath them. It is painfully obvious. What does GEB stand for again? Generalized Educational Board. Board. Is it in any way related to the idea of a GED? <laughs> like how you can kind of get mm-hmm. your, your high school equivalency? General equivalency. Is it that what this D stands for? Okay. Yeah. So I, I know they're not related, but it does occur to me that that being a thing, uh, a lot of people will do that so they can go ahead and start working on the factories quicker. You know right, I mean? right. Or you can get it like in prison. <laughs> That's or, also a thing. or your family is under dire circumstances. They need you, you to, help to get a be job. A breadwinner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, mm. I think, we all know folks like that. But regardless, the GEB accomplished their mission with great effect, and there are intergenerational consequences of this that echo into the modern day. You might be saying, "Wait, what about Prussia?" That's not all. As Billy Mays was wont to say, there's much more to the story. We're going to take a break uh, and, and hope the Rockefellers let us finish the episode. We've returned. All right. There are other education conspiracies, and they build toward the same argument. There's a Economist, a professor out of Northwestern University named Joel Mokier, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, who says these things are real. They're called factory schools, and the idea is not American. It's not from the GEB. It is from Prussia. In the early 19th century, the 1800s of Prussia, education was for the first time provided by the state, and learning was kind of regimented, kind of militarized. So you'd be grouped by age. I mean, that makes sense. That sounds like what I know of education. Right, because we were all taught with this kind of Prussian method. It was impersonal. It's efficient. It's standardized. It's edu- it's the fast food approach to education. Yeah. Every child, when you are this age, you will learn these things. And once you have graduated in revolutions around the sun, you can now read and learn these things. It makes sense to me. Yeah, exactly. And now we have now we have what leaders of a society always want. Consistency and predictability. Right? The following, you know, citizen A956 will uh 
matriculate at this age, they will leave school at this age, and when they leave school, they will know the following things, which makes them suitable for the following professions. Yay. Now, what does the child want to do? Doesn't matter. Does not matter. Uh, Because if they're smart and if they're educated correctly, what they'll want to do is what we want them to do. Weird. Yeah, it's a psyop. It's so strange to me because I well we we know this we've talked about this in the past the United States went through this kind of strange transformation in the in the times of cable where the wants the wants not the needs of children became paramount for advertising oh, agencies yeah. Yeah, for yeah. much of you know the 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 money that this country made by corporations existing within it selling services and goods to children and i i don't know there's something there's something speaking to me from that that's like it doesn't really oh god i don't know i want to say like doesn't even really matter what the child wants necessarily when you're thinking at it from this institutional thing it's more like what is the child excelling at what is the child good at like what what are the strengths um I don't I mean, know. Does what? that make sense? Or I don't know. I mean, you know, in, within public schools, there are things like gifted programs and sure. stuff like that. and Remedial uh, programs. Remedial programs. And sometimes you are forced to be in remedial programs if you are not excelling in certain things. And obviously, grades in and of themselves are a test of your aptitude as to whether you're any good at something or not. But you also, I mean, I say this from experience, you have to get your kid tested to see if they qualify for a gifted program and you have to make an effort to even care enough to put them into it. No one's just going to like come and take you under their wing, you know, and put you in the gifted program. It's something that the parents have to be cognizant of and and uh, be aware of and then also make some outside effort to get their kid in that track. So, yeah, it's a thing. It definitely is. Uh, it definitely is a thing. And again, it's an imperfect system, but to your point, Matt, about the uh, advertising reaching through children, I, I I gotta send you this compilation of all those creepy, ad, very blatant advertisements from the beginning of that era, where it's stuff like, "Don't wait, kids, run and tell your parents yes. to buy Kellogg's Asbestos Flakes." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. And I'm sorry to make that weird point. I I, I don't know. I mean, I, often I feel like some of my thinking is is just uh, silly and old school, but but I like want versus need, I think is an important thing when it comes to building sure. Uh again, a country, uh, mm. uh an industry, a nation or what, whatever you want to call it, like building a child is building the country. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. They're the foundation of a continuing civilization. So that is why the powerful will always focus on the children. Mm. Um, Sometimes with sincerity, often with ulterior motives, like in this case, uh, the the economist that we mentioned there, uh, Dr. Moiker, says much of the education kids were receiving in these Prussian schools. It wasn't technical in nature. It was social and moral. And it's because of the industrial revolution. This is what happened. So workers had always spent their days in a domestic setting. You know, you're an artisan, you're a farmer, you work out of your cottage. They had to be taught to follow orders to get into this kind of regimented hierarchy. Because unless you were yeah. in the military or the clergy, you would have never had that experience. It says then they had to be punctual. They had to be sober. They had to be docile. And the early industrial capitalist spent a huge amount of time socially conditioning their labor forces. Sunday schools, they were reaching people through th- Sunday school. They were reaching children, right? And they wanted to make the workers more malleable, you could say, more um, receptive to incentives. And that really yeah, checks out, Ben. It does? I'm thinking about my son going through public school system. I'm thinking about my 
public school, like early, early, right? Early stuff. When when we're really focused on learning the pledge, learning to sit down, the hand gesture or some vocalization that means every kid has to sit down That's right. and be quiet or sit crisscross. Holding up two or, fingers, I think, was yeah, the thing. That was yeah. It's yeah. still used, yeah. those kinds of things. And it's also that there's a taskmaster, a teacher, a, a, you know, a foreman, a whatever it is going to be, authority. can say, but you know. But devil's advocate, any position that any of us find ourselves in, we're going to have to be beholden to somebody. So, I mean, school is just there's part got of to, it. you, man. You're right. I'm, I'm devil's, I said devil's advocate. <laughs> That means anything I say after this, you, you don't have to take me seriously. No, I mean it. I, I hear mean, you. School is is intended to socialize us in a way where we do realize. I always tell my kid, like, school, you just have to get through it even though it sucks because it's teaching you. It's a, it's a model situation where you have to learn that everything isn't about you mm-hmm. and that you do have to think about what is the bigger picture, you know, and you have to also learn how to play the damn game. You have to learn to collaborate with people. Yes. Like, one of the this is something they don't talk about a lot but if you want to indoctrinate people the biggest thing you do is get them to perform series of ritualized vocalizations and physical movements in sync it's so singing the alphabet S T D W Y T K. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm just saying. I'm just, there's ready, a ready, reason. One more time, one more time. time. S T D W Y T K. Oh, God. No, Max, you better be mouthing that a lot. What have we okay. done? So, I mean, that's true. That's, that's how you create these behaviors. And this is the thing. Okay, this is insidious. It's not great. But it, it's kind of necessary in the Industrial Revolution. I mean, a lot of folks, like if to the point about authorities, if you took orders from someone in, in your typical job before the Industrial Revolution and you weren't in the military or the clergy, the person giving you the orders was like your f-ing dad. Or your dominatrix. <laughs> or your dominatrix. Sure. Yes, very common in agrarian society. <laughs> is Sorry. The, the dad or the dom, right? Uh, which is a famous Chaucer book. Yep. Uh, so the – so – for a lot of folks, the idea of going to this factory and working and taking orders from somebody who isn't even related to them hmm. is emasculating and humiliating. They're like, you're not my dad. You're not even a priest. Or the <laughs> king. Yeah, you're not the king. What are you, like the king of the, of the lace makers? Get out of here. Jeez. That's uh, weird to think about. It's true, though. As problematic as some of this stuff is, I do think it is interesting how we've moved so far away from like the apprentice kind of program and which I would argue is actually really good. Like if you want to become an expert at something, you 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 need to work under someone who has actual experience. And nowadays it's like everything's so freewheeling. You kind of, if you want to figure out how to do something, you just look it up on YouTube and you can kind of figure it out yourself. I think honestly, college is going to become less and less relevant as history goes on. You know? Well, I think the, the things that make college or university relevant may shift. That's right. Because the, I mean, the, one of the big points of going to an Ivy league school is not so much the education you receive as the, as the tribalism of it. Right. Um, and you can look at numerous studies that show matriculation in those um, in those societies does not equate to higher performance, unfortunately. And uh, th- that might be an episode for another day. But to to this point, you know, there are still like anybody listening who's in the trades now, there are still these really robust apprenticeship systems that work really well they just okay. take a long time maybe, maybe i'm just that's just not like you my, become a my journeyman of electrician or whatever okay so, so that okay maybe yeah. i see I, I retract my previous statement i guess i just it doesn't seem like it's as out in the open or as like part of the general it, it's system definitely not. as it used yeah, to be yeah. you're absolutely right it's not as um publicized or prioritized mm-hmm. or normalized so okay the question is though they had to do this right like this is kind of hacking or bootstrapping, as we said earlier, a huge social shift from agrarian rural agricultural economies to having people work in industry, in factories. The factories suck, by the way. The conditions are just terrible. And we haven't even gotten to reform 
of those types yet, right? No, no. People are still losing fingers and limbs yeah. willy nilly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're getting the crap beat out of them and stuff. And uh, kids are working. Uh, there. I was about to say, yeah. children mm-hmm. are working there. You know, because they can get in smaller spaces. Uh, everybody's got black lung. S- slight diversion, but my my dear friend, I think you guys both know Peyton, friend of the show. He sure. pointed out to me, uh, sort of a, a modern. He's concerned about a modern kind of callback to this, or he said he saw some shockingly young kids in New York City doing Uber Eats deliveries on bicycles. I mean, child labor. You know, there was a, a meat a meat packing interest that got uh, just got caught. With child labor, child labor is coming back. That's the what he's That's getting at, happening. and I think he's right. <laughs> so, right, yeah. and like wh- how education may be um, returning to some more, to some darker days. There was this thing in QZ, an author named Allison Schrager, who said that the the fat cats of the industrial revolution in Europe. They made the John Rockefeller decision. It sounds weird for ca- uh, big time investors and capitalists to do this, but those factory owners were the biggest champions for the Elementary Education Act of 1870, and that's what made education universally free and available in England. So for some reason, people who ordinarily are very not philanthropic doubled down on a way to get to your kids and a way to um, frame how your children see the world. We don't need no age. You're right, yeah. Uh, And it is thought control. And this Prussian-style approach made its way to the U.S. thanks to a guy named Horace Mann out in Massachusetts. The rest is history, but it's also the present day. It's also the future... Uh, the conspiracy is real. It's very much real, even if it was necessary. Um, and it, a lot of those quiet state by state decisions here in the United States about what can and cannot be taught, they hinge on ulterior motives. They hinge on stuff they don't want you to know. It it really does just make me think about what what of my base my baseline reactions to things have been honed by me going through that educational system. Right. The idea of what constitutes a full work day is one. Yeah. It just little things that I can't, that it's not possible for me to even recognize in a, a day-to-day life. You'd have to live in a different culture. Or yeah. See it. Or, or literally have a side-by-side observe like, oh, your reaction to that is very similar to when you were in kindergarten and this, you know, it's like uh, Yeah, that. exactly. And mm. it, it's, it's very tiny things. It's also uh, much larger things. And I, I don't know, you know, obviously this is not to denigrate teachers. We're no. huge fans of education. This is not to take a, to take pot shots at anybody, but, uh, well, John Rockefeller, hmm. he deserves it. Um, and we know it went a little bit long with this one, but it is a real conspiracy. And we'd love to hear your thoughts, folks. I mean, also... I'd love to hear how things are changing. I remember, I can't remember who I was talking to, but a friend of mine uh, who has a couple of kids was telling me the number one thing that kids want to be, that uh, she sees, are kids wanting to be influencers. In like middle school, they'll say, uh, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Astronauts have taken a back seat. Now it's, now it's influencers. You got to blow up the mainframes, guys. Yeah. How can we stop this? <laughs> That's <signal>? right, Max. <laughs> That's right. Somebody listening knows how to blow up the mainframes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, we thank you, as always, for tuning in, fellow conspiracy realists. We cannot wait to hear your thoughts, your approaches to education, what you think about these conspiracies. While that John Rockefeller quote may not be exactly what he said, it is very close to what he thought. It was Frederick's quote, mm-hmm. not was- me. Right, right. Different Frederick. And uh, he they were very much thinky doers. <laughs> so l- let us know your thoughts. Promise it's just going to be between you, us, and the NSA, unless you give us permission to use your voice and or message on air. That's right. You can find us at Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and TikTok.
If you don't like social media or the mainframes, why not call 1-833-STDWYTK? Oh, sorry, we just summoned something. Um, when you call in, give yourself a cool nickname. We don't care what it is, but we're excited to hear what you choose. Let us know if we can use your name and message on the air, and you've got three minutes. Yeah, that's it. Those are the rules. Um, guys, if they don't want to call, they don't like social media, is there another way to contact us? There sure is. You can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.